and we will jump right into section 1.1. So, I guess first of all, we should ask, let me see if I can make this uh, a little thicker. There we go. So we can ask, what is a differential equation? So that's probably the first thing we ought to address in a differential equations course. And the answer is that it's an equation unlike the equations we're used to, where we have unknown variables, like we saw for x or we saw for t or whatever. A differential equation relates an unknown function to the derivative. of the function. So, for example, it's a pretty rudimentary uh, differential equation, but suppose we're looking at a population function. So, We've got some function, p of t, population is changing with time. And we speculate what a population function might look like. And maybe we decide that we think a population function should satisfy the equation, the derivative of the population with respect to time equals, that's, that's three is big, equals 1.017 times the current population. Something like this might be a reasonably realistic thing to expect if there aren't limited resources you have to worry about. Because what this equation is telling you is that the rate of change, so the rate at which the population is increasing, is a constant times the current population. And that makes a certain amount of sense, you know. If they're looking at an animal population, the more animals there already are, the more animals there are to breed, and the quicker the population should increase. So you might expect that an animal population will satisfy some relation like this. And this is an example of a differential equation. You've got this unknown function, p of t, and you've got the derivative of that function, and a relationship between the derivative and the unknown function. So this is a pretty elementary example, but an example nevertheless of a differential equation. And in fact, differential equations that look like this 
dy dt equals k times y are fairly common. So I call it kind of elementary, but that's not the same as being unimportant. You see equations like this. Any time um, anytime the rate of change is a constant times the specific value. So this stopped being accurate eventually, but we saw this in the early days of the COVID epidemic. Um, a very similar logic to the reasoning we gave here, the more people are already sick, the more people there are to transmit the disease, and the faster other people therefore get sick. You can see it um, with the spread of a rumor. The more people have heard of a rumor, the more people are spreading the rumor, so the faster the rumor spreads. Situations like that. Then a solution to a differential equation. Well, is a function that satisfies it, it. but that me are uh, Let me qualify that statement a little. A solution to a differential equation is a function. I mean, here, this is a differential equation. A solution is a function, whatever this P of T is. Um, the function has to satisfy the differential equation on some interval. So it might not satisfy the differential equation everywhere, but it has to on an interval. So as a quick example of that, Say that we have dy dx equals 2 times x times y. Now, differential equations, the notation can be a little confusing when you first see it. So here, y is a function of x. Right? We're taking the derivative of the function y with respect to x. But we don't use function notation. I mean, you look at this x, and you look at this y, and they look like they're the same. They look like they're both variables. So that can be a little confusing, but it's unfortunately very standard at this point. So we don't know how to solve this differential equation. We don't know how to solve any differential equation. But I'm going to claim that y of x equals any constant c 
5 is e to the x squared is a solution to this differential equation. I claim that it satisfies it. That is, if you take this and you plug it in here and you plug it in there, you get the true statement. And let's see. dy dx. Uh, count this one was a while ago, but dy dx requires the chain rule. And it's 2 times x times c times e to the x squared. So again, using the chain rule, you take the derivative of that inside function. That's where the 2x comes from. The derivative of e to the x is e to the x. And 2x times c e to the x squared is 2x times y, right? Because y is c e to the x squared. So this function y satisfies that differential equation in the sense that when we plug it into the differential equation, we get a true statement. As a second example, here, will be the name of our function, t will be the name of our variable. That's another thing that students don't tend to be used to coming into differential equations. We, it's basically always been y is the name of our function, but in differential equations we often use x. And we can look at the differential equation dx dt equals x squared. And we can make the observation that x equals c divided by 1 minus c times t is a solution to this differential equation. Again, the question of where this solution comes from is one we are not prepared to answer at this point in time. But dx dt, if we use the quotient rule, the derivative of the top is 0 times the bottom minus the top times the derivative of the bottom all divided by the bottom squared. So that's c squared over 1 minus ct squared. And then a square divided by a square can be rewritten as a single square. And c divided by 1 minus ct is x. So this is x squared. So dx dt does indeed equal x squared. This is a solution to this differential equation. However, 
a difference between this example and the previous example. In this previous example, x could be any value. This is true on the entire real number line. Here, t cannot be any value. Some values of t will give you a division by zero error. So this is true. There's no real uh, space to write. Let me scroll that up there. Then erase that. And then section that off. This is true on an interval. It's true on the interval 1 over c to infinity. And it's true on the interval negative infinity to 1 over c. It's not true at 1 over c. It's not true everywhere but it is true on either of those intervals. And that's all that we need to say that something is a solution, is that it's true on at least one interval. I have a few remarks to make. Notice that in both of this example, and the previous example, I've talked sort of about loosely about this is a solution. Um, y equals c times e to the x squared is really an infinite class of solutions, right? Because c is a constant, it could be anything. So, y equals 3e to the x squared is a solution. y equals 2e to the x squared is also a solution. So there are an infinite number of solutions here. There are also an infinite number of solutions here. Precisely the same idea. Every value of C gives you a different solution. So in general, differential equations have infinitely many solutions. Um, in general, it's very easy. I mean, it's very easy to write down a differential equation that doesn't have any solutions. So, I mean, this is a pretty, this is a pretty inane example, but dx dt squared plus 5 equals zero. A differential equation with no solutions. Just because this square is always positive and a positive quantity plus five can't be a zero. But in practice, this isn't stuff like this isn't going to worry us. We're going to be looking at differential equations that have solutions, and those will have infinitely many 
solutions. There's a caveat to that statement. It's a true statement, but most real world differential equations will not be solvable by hand. So saying that there are solutions and saying that we can algebraically find the solutions are two very different things. Your textbook says that the goal of a differential equations course is to learn to solve differential equations. That's an extremely limited and I would say incorrect view of what we're going to be doing. Most differential equations we're not going to be able to solve by hand. However, we can still study them. And even if we can't solve them by hand, we can still try to get worthwhile information. So maybe we're looking at a population model. So the differential equation we have, maybe it's too complicated, we can't solve it by hand, but maybe we can determine whether the animals are going to go extinct. I mean, without actually writing down a solution, we might still be able to get useful information. And for most situations, I would say that that is the goal of differential equations, to get useful information about a solution, even if you can't actually solve it. And now, another definition. This also relates to the statement I made here that um, most differential equations will have infinitely many solutions. So I made the caveat that having infinitely many solutions doesn't mean we'll be able to actually write them down. Now let's make another caveat or another definition at least. An initial value problem is a differential equation plus some kind of data about the function. So for example, maybe we know that when x equals zero, y equals five. 
So we're given a differential equation, and then we're given some piece of information like this. Unlike differential equations, which have infinitely many solutions, initial value problems should just have one solution. The solution should be a unique. So let's go back to this and let's erase some stuff. So let's say we have this differential equation and now let's give that piece of data that x of zero equals one. Well, x of zero is c divided by one minus zero. If x of zero is supposed to equal one, this lets us solve for C. This lets us find that C equals 1. And now, our differential equation had infinitely many solutions, one for every different value of C. But this initial value collapsed that down, and now we have only one solution. x equals 1 divided by 1 minus t. Um, initial values, by far the most common initial value is what is this function doing at zero? That's, the, that's where the word initial comes from. But it doesn't have to be that. We could have x. We could have, say, x of 3 equals 1. And then that would say that c divided by 1 minus 3c equals 1. And we could then solve this for c. Multiply both sides by the denominator. Get c by itself. C has to equal one fourth if we want x of three to be one. So the most common initial value is what happens at zero, hence the word initial, but it doesn't have to be. We can just have any piece of information. So, is everybody with me so far? Does anybody have any questions at this point? Then that's This first section is really just a bunch of definitions. Let's talk about classifying differential 
equations. So there are a few ways that we classify differential equations. The first way is, in a sense, probably the most important way, but in this class it's almost never going to come up. And the reason for that is that in this class we are only going to work with what we call ordinary differential equations. But what is an ordinary differential equation? What is a partial differential equation? Well, an ordinary differential equation is one that has no partial derivatives, whereas a partial differential equation has partial derivatives. And I mean, I know at least some of you took Calc 3 last semester. Calc 3 is not a prerequisite for this course, precisely because we don't work with partial derivatives in this course. We just work with the kind of derivatives we saw in Calc to this one. Another way we classify differential equations is by order. And that me, because I'm definitely going to end up wanting to use this definition, an ordinary differential equation is an ODE. So, the order of a differential equation is the highest order derivative, derivative that appears in it. So, the differential equations I've put on the board have all been first order. This is the first derivative. That's the first derivative. That's the first derivative. But we could have a differential equation where, like, the second derivative of the function plus the variable times the first derivative of the function equals the sine of the function, something like that. This is a perfectly valid differential equation, and it is no longer first order because we've got the second derivative. It is now second order. Uh, make sure not to confuse orders with power. If we added a y to the fifth, this is still a second order differential equation. We've got, we've got the first derivative here, 
and we've got the second derivative there, and those are the only derivatives we have, so 2 is bigger than 1, it's second order. This 5 is not a derivative, it's just a power, it's not affecting the order. In general, this is probably a pretty obvious or intuitive statement, but in general, solving low-order differential equations is easier than solving high-order differential equations. Finally, a differential equation can be linear or nonlinear. So let's be explicit here. Y is our function, X is our variable. A Linear differential equation has the form. It sort of looks like a polynomial, I guess. A function of x times our unknown function y differentiated some number of times. Thus, another function of x times our unknown function y differentiated n minus 1 times. Thus, as I say, this is ver a very polynomial-looking thing. Let's see. Uh, our last term is a function of x times y where y is no longer being differentiated, and all of this equals a function of x. And I mean, I keep saying the phrase, a function of x. It all depends on what you're calling your variables. I mean, maybe you're calling your function t, your function x, and your variable t. It's, um, it all depends. But the point is that our derivatives are just appearing by themselves. We've got this nth derivative, this is an nth order linear differential equation. Then we've got the n minus first derivative, the n minus second derivative, down to the original function. So something like the natural log of x times the second derivative of y plus 3 times the first derivative of y plus 1 over x times y by itself equals the cosine of x. This is an example of a linear differential equation. An example of a non-linear differential equation would be if instead of the natural log of x, 
you had the natural log of Y there. Or maybe you still have Maybe you keep the natural log of x, but instead of the cosine of x on the right, you have the cosine of y. That's a nonlinear differential equation. Um, Basically, every real-world differential equation that matters is nonlinear. In spite of that, we're going to spend a lot of time working with linear differential equations in this course, and there's a legitimate reason to do that. It turns out that linear differential equations can be used as a tool to study nonlinear differential equations. So nonlinear differential equations, important for their own sake, show up in a lot of applications. Linear differential equations don't show up in applications, but show up in techniques when we want to study nonlinear differential equations. Any questions about ODEs versus PDEs or linear versus nonlinear differential equations? Then I mentioned real world situations, a model is a differential equation that represents some real world situation. Differential equations, I mean, at some point, the distinction between pure and applied math can get pretty arbitrary. Like I've attended alleged applied math talks with, with no applications in sight. But differential equations are part of applied mathematics. Ultimately, we care about them because they show up in various fields of science in social fields, in various applications. And when you're trying to model a real-world situation with a differential equation, it is appropriately called a model. Now, this isn't a modeling class, but if you're going to talk about models at all, it's, I think, incumbent on you to make the following observation. No model is perfectly accurate. are based on incorrect assumptions. 
And that's certainly not saying that mod thing isn't useful. I mean, we saw mathematical models being used a lot well, when governments were trying to figure out how to respond to the COVID epidemic. It's just, I mean, you do have to understand their limitations. So, like, I gave this as a population model. DP DT equals K times P. There's a, um, I had some number in for K, one point something. But this is a model for population growth. This is a very simple model. And this very simple model carries with it the following assumption. This K is the birth rate minus the death rate of the species in question. And this model carries with it the assumption that these birth rates and these death rates are not changing over time. So this is an assumption of the model. And this assumption will never be completely right. I mean, all animal populations have some elements of chaos in what their birth rates are doing, what their death rates are doing. That doesn't mean this model was worth this. This model can be used in situations where there are not limited resources. Like if you take a bacteria and you put it into a resource-rich medium and you just let the bacteria population grow, it will grow more or less according to this model for a while. After a while, the bacteria will have grown about as big as it can grow. Its birth rate will shrink. And this assumption that the birth rate doesn't change stops being accurate. So this model stops being useful. Another population model. We'll look at this model either this week, next week, I can't remember, but we'll see where it comes from. So this is another population model. It is more complicated than the one on the previous frame. But this model does not assume that the birth rate and death rate are fixed. This model assumes that as the population grows, the birth rate will decrease. That's a very sensible assumption if we're looking at limited resources. The more animals there already are, the fewer new animals can be born, so the slower or the lower the birth rate. So this model carries with it a different set of assumptions. 
and there's no one correct model for looking at population. There are a bunch of different population models, and you have to ask yourself, well, what assumptions am I trying to make here? What assumptions do I want to be baked into the model? This model doesn't assume that birth rates and death rates are fixed, but you'll notice that the time parameter doesn't show up on the right. So this model assumes that the birth rate and the death rate just depend on the population. There are species of insects, though, where that's a very inaccurate assumption, because what these insects do is they lie dormant for long periods of time before becoming active again. So a model that doesn't have time over on the right here is no good for those insects because you need to know what the season is if you want to get information about those populations. So it's always a balancing act and kind of the thing that makes it a balancing act is that the more details you throw into the model, the harder it's going to be to use the model to do anything. I, uh, my, my graduate degree, I was doing math biology. I was looking at models of yeast. And I mean, I found this research group that tried to perfectly model the growth of a yeast cell, and it had hundreds of equations and hundreds of variables, and what is anybody supposed to do with something like that? It was very accurate, maybe, but also completely impossible to study. So people who do this stuff professionally have to try to balance those things. They need to try to create models that are accurate enough to make useful predictions, but not so complicated that nobody can study them or do anything with them. That takes us more or less to the end of um, our class time, and it takes us to the end of section 1.1. So that seems like a sensible place to call this. I will see all of you Thursday. It's um, nice to meet you, the three familiar faces. It's nice to see all of you again.